No matter where you are located in the world, the UCLA Center for Middle East Development would like to welcome you to our fifth episode of a unique monthly series called CMED Chats. My name is Emily Pistoli, a center associate at CMED, and I'm very excited that you have joined us today. The CMED Chat series engages charismatic guests who are from the Middle East and North Africa, or who are connected to the region in some capacity. Our equally engaging hosts will vary throughout the series to keep the conversations diverse. Together, they will sit down for casual one-on-one -on -one chats that will cover a variety of topics and highlight the many voices and realities that enrich the colorful region we lovingly know as MENA. All CMED Chats episodes will be recorded and can be viewed on CMED's website or YouTube page within 24 hours of this broadcast. We will not be accepting audience questions for our live guests. However, if you have any logistics questions, feel free to let us know in the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen. And without further ado, I will pass the microphone to CMED's director, Professor Steven Spiegel. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much, uh, uh, Emily. Uh, and hello to everyone uh, from around the world. <laughs> Today, I'll be sitting down with a long time personal friend and Middle East super expert to discuss his career experiences and insights about recent events that impact the region. Aaron David Miller is a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, focusing on US foreign policy. Uh, I'm going to say a few words about him. I can't possibly be fair because he has had such an illustrious uh, career so far. Uh, he has written five books, including his most recent, The End of Greatness, why America Can't Have and Doesn't Want Another Great President, Palgrave 2014, uh, and The Much Too Promised Land, America's Elusive Search for Arab Israeli Peace from Bantam. Between 1978 and 2003, Miller served at the State Department as a historian, analyst, negotiator, and advisor to Republican and Democratic Secretaries of State, where he helped formulate uh, US policy on the Middle East and the Arab Israeli peace process, most recently as the senior advisor for Arab-Israeli negotiations. He also served as the deputy uh, uh, special Middle East coordinator for Arab-Israeli negotiations, senior member uh, of the State Department's policy planning staff in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research and in the office of the historian. He has received the department's distinguished superior and meritorious honor awards from 2006 to 2019. Um, uh, Aaron was a public policy scholar, vice president for new initiatives and director of the Middle East program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. He is also a global affairs analyst for CNN. I watch him, do you? Uh, his articles have appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, Political, Foreign Policy, USA Today, and CNN.com. He is a frequent commentator on NPR, BBC, and Sirius XM radio. So let me introduce to you, Aaron David Miller. Uh, so <laughs> uh, uh, Aaron, uh, uh, let's uh, spend a few minutes because we're supposed to go through your career. Uh, and first, what led you to go into government originally? Um, I don't know if it's true anymore. It was certainly true in the late 60s, early 70s, that a student in this case, me at the University of Michigan could be profoundly influenced by two of my professors. Uh, both had come to the University of Michigan, both were trained historians. One, Richard Mitchell, was the authority and wrote the, I think, the first prominent book in English on, on the Muslim Brotherhood on the Hua, and the other, Gerald Linderman, was a historian of Americans at war. Both of these men had come to the university after they had served in government, um, both at the State Department, uh, at least in Mitchell's case, nominally. Uh, Jerry served in Africa and Dick Mitchell uh, served in the Middle East. And the stories they told, the experiences they related, the whole notion of trying to come to grips with the world, foreign policy, um, simply by reading books in a library uh, sort of lost its appeal. And here were two guys who actually 
saw the region up close and personal. And from my perspective, focusing on America, then in the Middle East, now in the world, I, I very much wanted those experiences. So I basically shifted my field from um, Civil War history to um, modern Middle East and American diplomacy, largely influenced by Jerry Linderman and Dick Mitchell. And I owe them an enormous uh, debt of gratitude because however my career, at least on the professional government side was highlighted largely by failure rather than success, um, the road that I traveled, and I had many regrets, but the road that I traveled, I would not have, um, I would not have picked a, a different one. You know, uh, it's very interesting, uh, your, your question. I think today uh, there are fewer uh, representatives of, of government experience uh, in universities and therefore students don't have the experience that you had, it's my own feeling, being at UCLA for so many years. And um, I think it's a shame for America because uh, the Aaron David Millers don't have the opportunity to get excited about government. I think this is a very important point and I think it hurts us. But uh, let's go on. What was government service like? Uh, and do you have a couple of examples of your most interesting experiences? Well, I, you know, I started, I'm a professional historian and first I wrote five books, but only one I would argue was a serious history book. It was my dissertation. It was on the US and Saudi Arabia during the formative years of that relationship. Um, my early years in government had nothing to do with policy. I started as a historian uh, editing the foreign relations series of the United States. I was then offered an opportunity with very little experience um, to become an intelligence analyst, State Department, uh, during some very uh, uh, formidable years, the early 80s. And I was charged with covering, quote, the Palestinians, unquote, in Lebanon. And I would only point out as a, as a reference point, given the challenging nature of this task, um, CIA must have had 10 analysts alone to deal with Lebanon. I was the State Department's only analyst. And um, those were very uh, challenging years. Uh, Israel invaded Lebanon in June of 82. For those several years, uh, it was as if I was um, on the front lines, um, working every day, sometimes through the night, um, and um, forcing myself to digest huge amounts of information and render, render that information in no more than 46 lines, um, crisply and economically rendered for the Secretary of State of the United States of America. Um, it was during those years that uh, I also <clears throat> experienced, I suppose, uh, it was my exposure to what I had missed in the 60s, which was heavy involvement in, in Vietnam, either as an activist, as my wife Lindsay reminds me, I basically sat out the 60s, well, at least in most, <laughs> in most dimensions of the human experience. Lindsay did not. I mean, she was protesting, demonstrating, and then some. But it was during those years that um, uh, those intelligence assessments that we jointly produced with CIA challenged the bases of American policy in a enterprise, which I would argue was doomed from the beginning and it ended tragically with the deaths of 241 Marines in Lebanon in 1983. Um, I remember and I became very much interested even before I, I even met a Secretary of State in the whole policy enterprise during those years, because it was as a young intelligence analyst, I think one of the highlights of my early years was sitting at my desk one morning and uh, the phone rings and the voice on the other end of the phone says, uh, it's the White House sit room calling, could you hold? So I'm holding, um, wondering, 
what's this all about? The next voice I hear is the following. Aaron, this is Vice President George H.W. Bush. I read one of your memos on Lebanon, and here's what he said, and I will forever remember it. I know how busy you are, but I wonder if you have a few minutes to talk about it. That phone call, you know, was formative because here was a guy who knew what he didn't know and seemed to be in a hurry to find out. Kennedy used to call the Vietnam analysts at state who worked for the Bureau of Intelligence and Research, INR, which I, I would argue the 16 current units of the intelligence community, INR still produces the best intelligence assessments, largely because an INR analyst, there's only one of them and they're forced to look not only at the granular, but the world from 30,000 feet. Um, but I, I got off the phone and I thought to myself, curiosity, curiosity, an essential requirement of success in the presidency and, and leadership. So I, I also developed during those years a high, a high degree of respect for intelligence analysis and the importance of standing up to power when in fact the analysis went the other way, which, which brings me to this, so many different experiences, Steve, but the counterpoint to that one was the second briefing we did for President Bill Clinton uh, three days before the Camp David summit in July of 2000. Clinton, to his credit, the invitation's already been issued for the summit, but Clinton, to his credit, went around the room and asked everyone whether or not it was a good idea that he go. I was the last person to speak. I was the most junior person in that room, Secretary of State, National Security Advisor, President's political advisors. Everyone more or less said the same thing. Mr. President, you have to go because if you don't go, there may be violence. Uh, you care about this issue. You have to use the last six months of your presidency to see what it is you can do. And I remember thinking to myself that I had a moment right there there was no way Camp David was going to succeed. Barack wasn't ready. However, forthcoming some of his ideas were. Arafat came to Camp David to survive, and we weren't ready. This was not Camp David one when Jimmy Carter uh, controlled the te the text, the draft, which went through twenty three plus iterations. The summit ran us. We didn't run the summit. But instead of telling the president of the United States what I should have told him which was, Mr. President, you will not reach an agreement at Camp David. Listen to what I'm telling you. You have to start now to think about how to have this summit end in a way that doesn't produce a climate of mutual recrimination, suspicion, and violence. Instead of doing that, I said what everybody else said. It, and I, st I still regret it. And the reason I did that, because I know, had I said, had I told a, a sitting US president, that he would fail at a summit, the invitations had, had already been issued, there would have been one less member of the American delegation going to Camp David. Or if they allowed me to go, I would have been rendered irrelevant. That's instructive. And it was not what I would call character. And it was certainly not truth to power. No matter what I would have said, Clinton, was going to Camp David. The invites were already out, but our mindset might have been different. And uh, in my judgment, I think I was a disappointment and was not serving the interests of the Republic. Well, all right. How would you uh, analyze the presidents you worked for? I understand that you weren't in their offices or whatever, but you've just given two examples of, president, of a future president and a, and a president. Um, what was it all like? Well, first of all, I worked for half a dozen secretaries of state and uh, they worked for the president. I had contact with all of them, but did not work out of the White House or for the White House. And when it came to the issue that I followed, which was Arab-Israeli peacemaking, it was rare and still is to find uh, any president prepared to devote um, in a single-minded fashion, the kind of time and effort 
on the Arab-Israeli issue, the Israeli-Palestinian issue, that might have been required had the circumstances uh, in favor of a negotiation and an agreement been there. Uh, Bill Clinton, in large part because Rabin and Arafat um, gave him a piece of history, invited him into history with the sign of a historic yet flawed and, and ultimately uh, unsuccessful uh, set of agreements known as the Oslo process, devoted an enormous amount of attention to this issue. He inherited a working process from George H.W. Bush, which was Madrid, and to his credit, he did not allow domestic politics to alter the fact that uh, there was a working negotiation <clears throat> and could Bill Clinton turn the 90s, the decade in which he essentially two-term president, uh, held the con and was in control, could he achieve some measure of success? I, I might point out, by the way, that the 90s was the only decade in the last century in which there was no major Arab-Israeli confrontation. 48, 56, 67, 73, 82. The 90s came and went without a major confrontation. I would argue part of that reason Part of it was uh, a certain degree of ownership by Arabs and Israelis of their own negotiations, but also a measure of stewardship on the part of the United States, even though we largely, uh, well, you could say we didn't succeed or we failed for a variety of reasons. Um, it, was, it was an effort uh, by a US president who cared deeply about this issue and was prepared to, to go a certain, to certain lengths in order to apply, in the, in the words of the late Sam Lewis, <clears throat> the honey and the vinegar, the honey and the vinegar required the incentives and the disincentives required to um, bridge gaps that might have led to uh, an agreement. Um, the presidents that followed dealt episodic, uh, episodically. I left the State Department in 03 in January, uh, several months before we invaded Iraq. Um, the priorities of that administration uh, were clear. They were not focused on Arab-Israeli peacemaking. I left the department largely because I had concluded that my relevance and role in this process had run its course. Um, uh, so we, we, haven't, we haven't seen another U.S. president invest the kind of time and energy that Baker as a secretary of state or Clinton uh, as a president invested. And it may well be uh, that we won't see another president um, invest that kind of time for some time to come. But perhaps that could be changed by events, which always alter the best laid plans. Well, um, uh, you've, you've t <laughs> answered a couple of my questions. Let me just ask you, and then let's move on uh, to your second um, experience. But let's, um, you know, outside government, um, how about the secretaries of state? Are there any that were particularly effective that you worked with? Well, I liked them all. I respected them all. I, I started working for George Schultz. Um, and by incidentally, the greatest impact I had on the Secretary of State during the 25 years of my career occurred on a tennis court in Cairo when George Schultz is my doubles partner, unfortunately, was hit in the back by an errant, errant, errant serve. Um, and I had pretensions to be a professional tennis player um, in my early days. The first serve caught the Secretary above his back brace. Uh, and he crumpled to the court and I ran over to him, um, not knowing what to say, but watching the diplomatic security guys who were providing protection, you know, laughing. Um, laughing? Not, <laughs> laughing. Well, to them, they wonder where my next assignment was. Schultz <laughs> was not happy. Um, I like that, that man a, a great deal, but he was not happy. And all he could say was get back to the baseline and serve your second serve. Um, at any rate, I like them all. I respect them all. Schultz through Powell. 
Um, the one that I would argue, and none of them would dispute this, um, was James Baker. Baker was the most effective yeah. Secretary of State, in my judgment, since Henry Kissinger. In terms of accomplishments, there were obviously asterisks and deficits um, uh, with each of them. But Baker was an extraordinary negotiator, an unbelievable actor. Based on his experience in Washington and an aspiring politician as well, his memoirs are called "The Politics of Diplomacy," and I think Baker had it right. One of the reasons Baker was so successful in the Middle East, and it is my conviction, by the way, that had Rabin not been murdered and Bush forty-one gotten a second term, we would have succeeded in in getting one agreement, either between Israel and Syria or probably less likely between Israel uh, and the Palestinians. It was also Baker who in his memoirs described the time I walked into the it walked in a cable to him uh, terminating the US PLO dialogue because a small member of the PLO's executive committee, the Arab Liberation Front had attempted a terror attack against an Israeli beach in 90 Baker was very frustrated and he looked at the cable, signed it, which would effectively have instructed Bob Pelletro, who was our ambassador in Tunis to terminate the dial. He looked at me and he said, threw the cable up in the air and looked at me and said, Aaron, in his Texas accent, he said, Aaron, in my next life, I want to be a Middle East negotiator just like you because I know I'll be guaranteed a permanent source of employment. <laughs> Baker was... Baker was an extraordinary Secretary of State and exactly the kind of Secretary of State we needed, not just with respect to the Arab-Israeli issue. I describe Baker as someone who, for whom the world was an unassembled jigsaw puzzle on his living room floor. And Baker was great at seeing how the pieces connected and then understanding the needs and requirements of the parties and tough enough and accommodating enough to bring them to an agreement. And I watched on the road to Madrid, a procedural breakthrough, admittedly, but I, I repeat what I said to you earlier, Steve, had Rabin not been murdered and had Bush 41 gotten a second term with Baker, Bush, Rabin, and either Assad or Arafat, I think we, it was a pretty good chance we would have reached a single agreement. And perhaps you and I would be having a different kind of conversation today. Yes, we certainly would have under those conditions. Um, we could talk about that, but let's move on. You're out of government um, in, uh, in the last several years. How has it been different? And, um, and, and what are your feeling of greatest accomplishments in the outside world? Uh, working with so many uh, individuals uh, who are very interested in these topics. Yeah, I'll be very blunt about this. Nothing I will ever do professionally will be as meaningful uh, or as consequential, despite uh, the fact that failure seemed to be the hallmark of the 20 plus years that I spent doing this as those years inside, nothing, in large part because um, those 20 years and anyone who served in government for an extended length of time and had respect for the institutions and was prepared to cope with the uncertainties and the hardships, particularly the family that those years generated, would realize that Government is a question of turning the M in me upside down, so it becomes a W in we. The experience outside of government is, at least my experience outside of government was fundamentally different. I've tried to link what I've done to um, a broader purpose and a greater good. I've spent the last 18 years 
since leaving government trying to explain to the world or anyone who would listen why we did not succeed and what would have been required, uh, not just in Arab-Israeli peacemaking, but what is required to have an effective and meaningful foreign policy that has involved uh, a lot of mea culpas. It's involved a lot of um, looks in the mirror, but I think I was obligated to do that because writing op-eds and talking on TV, it's, yeah, it's great. It's a lot of fun, but what's it tethered to? What is the broader purpose? Yeah, education for the purpose of education, enlightenment, all that's fine. But it's untethered from a broader goal. And my goal was to demonstrate through looking back why we behave the way we do and why we still behave the way we do. And I, I, have, I believe that uh, part of the explanation lies in the fact that we don't understand the world largely because of our geographic location. We're the only great power in the history of the world, the only one, there are no exceptions, none, that had non-predatory neighbors to our north and south and literally fish to our east and west. What one historian, I wish it had been me, described as our liquid assets. These two oceans and these non-predatory neighbors separate us from every other country with which and every other leader with whom we deal. We have freed ourselves from the forces of history and geography in a way no other nation in the world has or will ever have. That's true of, the, of Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, the Israelis, Palestinians, the Egyptians. It doesn't matter. They are haunted by these two forces. Our physical location has freed us from them. The nature of our political system when it was functional the abundance of natural resources, the very size and openness of this country has given us an opportunity and it explains a lot. It explains our arrogance because we have a margin for error that is virtually larger than any other country. We can make many mistakes without threatening the existence of this Republic. It explains our naivete. I don't think we understand the mentality of the small power. And when I say small power, I think it equally applies to a country like China haunted by the forces of, of history and geography in ways that we're not. And it explains our practicality and pragmatism. We somehow wrongly believe that every problem in the world must have a solution. If only rational men and women would sit down through enlightened dialogue and discourse and the meeting of basic needs and requirements, everything would be okay. But I'm a Niburian. I'm a follower of the great Protestant theologian, Reinhold Niebuhr, proximate solutions to insoluble problems. I don't see how anyone could look at the world today and identify a single issue, one, just give me one issue that is tractable and resolvable in a way that is final and determinative. What to do about Iran's putative nuclear weapons aspirations? What to do about the fact that Kim Jong-un has an arsenal? What to do about Chinese, China's rising power? What to do about Putin's skillful use of Russia as a declining power? <clears throat> what to do about the Arab-Israeli issue and the Israeli-Palestinian issue? What to do about Syria? And what do we do about Afghanistan? We do not have it within our power to refashion the internal contexts, characters, and systems of the nations with which we deal, we need to be very humble and careful in the use of American power if that is our goal, because we're likely to fail. So your explanation of our mess in Af uh, Afghanistan is what you just said. Is there anything else that particularly explains uh, our 20 years in Afghanistan and getting involved and then trying to change the country and then messing it all up or, or being yeah. messed up? I, I think a, a, an administration that had to contend with a frightening moment, and I'll never forget driving down to the State Department 
uh, on that beautiful, bright, sunny morning on September 11th, listening to some radio station talk about a small plane hitting one of the towers. Um, the fear, the uncertainty, the shock of what occurred. You know, the word for religion comes from the Latin religio or religio, meaning to adhere or to bind. I think 9-11 created in the minds of many senior Bush administration's official, officials, a kind of religion. And I think that religion, Iraq and Afghanistan, there would have been no Iraq and Afghanistan without 9-11. The single bloodiest day in American history, with the exception of the Battle of Antietam in Sharpsburg, not far from where I'm sitting. Um, and I think the early successes of American counterinsurgency and CAA operatives and limited use of American military power that fall um, and basically was turned into a counterinsurgency whose primary objective was to eliminate the insurgents by eliminating the cause and the systemic reasons that there was an insurgency. And I know a lot of liberal interventionists and neoconservatives who both come together in this. You wanna end the war on terror? Well, the way, the, the way to stop terrorism in the world is to get to the systemic roots of what causes it, the sectarian tensions, the loss of identity, the alienation, the bad governance, the empty spaces, the lack of the corruption. Fine, it's a wonderful notion, but how do you operationalize it? We tried to do that. It's a combination of arrogance and ignorance that was stunning, epically stunning. And then knowing we launched into Afghanistan, we then got distracted by, Afghanistan was a war of necessity originally. We were attacked, we responded. Iraq was a discretionary war. What vital interests were involved in order to summon the greatest projection of American military power to Vietnam? It's a country, country roughly the size population-wise of the state of California was invaded and occupied its political structure stripped bare, its army disbanded with insufficient American forces and a woeful knowledge of Iraq and what Iraqis wanted. I mean, it was arrogance and ignorance. Is the problem America or is it particularly administrations that go off, uh, off the base and get us yeah. into trouble? I mean, 9-11 was an idiosyncratic event. Other than Pearl Harbor, which was an attack on American territory, but certainly not an attack on the continental United States, there's been no other event. So you could argue that 9-11 created the need for an idiocrat idiocratic response, a response qualitatively and quantitatively different than anything the United States had ever done. And I, I say again, no 9-11, no Afghanistan, no Iraq. I don't know which page of Baker's memoirs in the politics of diplomacy contains two paragraphs, which lays out why the first Bush administration decided not to go to Baghdad. It's prudence, it's discretion, it's restraint, it's matching means and ends, it's understanding that when America goes to war, the issue is not just, can we do it? It's, should we do it? It's, what does it cost? It's, what is the relationship between the means at our disposal and the political objectives that we seek to, to achieve? All of these things were not addressed. And I, I just find it astounding. And there will be, by the way, no accountability. There'll be no accountability because this is, a, this is an environment that is too partisan to summon up consensus accountability. There'll be no uh, um, accountability because 
it spans three administrations, four if you count the Biden administration, scores of humans, official at the Department of Defense, CIA, the executive branch and Congress. There'll be no accountability because we're still in one of those enterprises. It's called Iraq. Who's going to investigate an ongoing conflict, the roots of an ongoing conflict? Because you cannot do Afghanistan without doing Iraq. So in my judgment, there'll be no accountability. And there rarely is. So what, what do we do now? I mean, the argument is we had to get out of Afghanistan because we have so many other problems from China uh, 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 to uh, more possible attacks on the United States and, and, and friends right. of ours, uh, especially now that, that the Taliban's returned. So where do we go now? What do we do? Well, let, let me, How do we let avoid me what you've described? For the, for the last five years, I've had one talking point. You've heard it before, and I'll say it again. And it is this. Um, and I believe truly that if, if Joe Biden was on this call and you asked, and, 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 he, and he was brutally honest, he would say exactly what I'm about to say to you. And that's this. And I say this as an American, let's, let's be clear here. With all the selfishness and um, sort of solipsism and focus on what's good for this country, there is no single foreign policy issue out there, not a one, that is more damaging or potentially dangerous to this republic and certainly to the Biden presidency than the three or four interlocked crises, challenges, call them whatever you want, that we confronted home. And it's not as if we're not prepared, we can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Oh yeah, we can have a foreign policy, we can do foreign policy. But governing is about choosing. FDR once said of Lincoln, that Lincoln died a sad man because he couldn't have everything. This is our most undeniably greatest president who in his seven years probably did more to say, not, not just preserve the union, but to create a second American revolution and create a basis on which we presume to, to anchor and tether the forces of racial equality and fairness in this country. 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments of the Constitution were all products of Lincoln's leadership, even though he was alive for only one of them. And I'm not sure he even saw the, the passage of that. He saw the House vote on it. Um, no, for me, as a foreign policy person, that's not, governing is about choosing. We need, to, we need to fix our own broken house because that is the source of our resilience, our power, our values, the whole moral basis for what the American experiment represents, in my judgment, is compromised and undermined. I mean, I, I don't, you know, not everyone, so many people disagree with me. They think I'm too hard on America. No, it's the it's uh, it's the it's the reverse. I'm selfishly focused on what is required to try to fix what ails the nation, and we cannot do it by espousing grandiose proclamations on foreign policy that aren't tethered to reality. You cannot divide the world as the Biden administration has done into democracies and autocracies. That's a nice frame of reference but it's not an operating principle for what is still the most consequential nation on earth. How do you solve climate without Russia and China? How do you preserve biodiversity without working with regimes who don't share your values? How do you deal with the issue of nuclear proliferation without somehow finding a way to deal with Iran or North Korea? And how do you deal with the greatest threat to the world since the Second World War. 
COVID and all of its variants. This COVID was the most world altering event since the Second World War. And it has demonstrated the failure of globalization, of multilateral diplomacy, of looking at the world as a united, unified whole. And it's dangerous because if we don't vaccinate the world, there are going to be a lot of variants. So, uh, you know, I, I, I come back to what I consider to be first principles. We got to get America right. And I say that knowing how hard a challenge it's going to be. Well, let's try to analyze this as we uh, grow near to our conclusion. And that is COVID in the world, extremely important uh, uh, point. Um, how, how do we do it? Why haven't we paid more attention? Because you can't get rid of COVID by just get rid of it, and we're having enough trouble at home, getting rid of it here. Why isn't there more attention? Uh, and uh, what do we do? Because when nations are faced with excess, you know, COVID was on paper, the only existential threat that we, that we have faced, existential in the sense that on paper it threatened the well-being of every single human in this country. You can't get any more existential than that. Um, I, I think part of it lies in the fact that during periods of stress, and tension and threat, nations focus more on guarding and preserving their own national sovereignty, their own health structures, their own economies. The tendency is not to share. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking back on a movie called The Day the, the World stood, stood Still. There are a couple different iterations, but the movie ends, the aliens threaten the United States, the movie ends, with the Security Council or the UN arguing about whether or not they can rise to the challenge of uniting the world or face destruction by the aliens. So I don't, I mean, as a practical matter, you're, you're gonna need to create indigenous sources of production for vaccines in various countries. We have 1.7 billion doses that's five for every human in this country. Uh, can we be more generous in terms of vaccine distribution? Absolutely, but that won't, that won't fix the problem. You're gonna to have to create indigenous sources of production, which is gonna mean dealing with the pharmaceuticals and uh, companies and patents. And I, I think I would argue to you, it's kind of already too late. I mean, how many people in the world, 8 billion? How many people have actually been vaccinated, 7 billion? I mean, one billion, the, the majority of the world is not vaccinated. And that creates a huge Petri dish for the spread of, of variants and obviously, and, and all of the human destruction that goes along with this disease, the uncertainty, the devastation of the economy, social structure, all of that. So why aren't um, we doing more? Proximate solutions to insoluble problems. Why, Steve? Because why don't we have a comprehensive policy on anything in this country? Why don't we have a comprehensive policy on a rational policy on gun control? Why don't we have a rational policy on um, health care? Why are we still struggling decades later without a policy, rational policy on immigration? We love declaring war on things. There's the war on drugs, there's the war on crime, there's the war on poverty, there's the war on terror, there's the war on mental illness, the war, the war on racial injustice. We don't win these wars because they require solutions that are at odds with the very nature of the political system that the founders established. They set up a system with three branches of government, shared and separated powers, which is essentially an open invitation to struggle and to argue, and you know why they did it? They did it because they feared the concentration of power, either by the royal governors and certainly by the king. And we live with that system today. That's why I argue in my, in my book, why we can't have, which is I think easier to explain than why we don't want another great president. You need three things for greatness in the presidency. You need a crisis that is so hot, so irreparable, 
that it forces everybody into a situation where they have no other choice than to agree to an accretion of power by the central government. And then you need the other two C's. You need the character, you need character, and you need capacity in the man and one day woman who will be president. The three C's of presidential greatness. Crisis opens the door, character and capacity are the qual qualities that you need for presidents to, to know what to do with the crisis. That's why we've only had three undeniably great presidents, one in every century. I won't identify them for you because I think one in each century, you'll be able to figure that out on your own. And that's why we haven't had another great president, undeniably great president since Franklin Roosevelt with all of his imperfections and transgressions. Well, so, like and we don't, so I, can't, I can't answer your question because if Reinhold Niebuhr were on the call, he'd say, look guys and girls, you're not, you can't have comprehensive solutions in America. The nature of our political culture and our system resist it. And now it's worse than ever. Because uh, millions of Americans disagree with other millions of Americans on basic empirical data. How can you have self-governance, Steve, effective self-governance, when the very nature of truth is open to interpretation. If that is the case, if truth is open to interpretation, then doesn't that open the door to somebody riding in on a white horse, a he or a she, who is gonna tell you, Steve Spiegel, what truth is? Yeah, it does. And you saw, you saw a act one in this play. You saw it over the last four years. And had the predecessor of this president been more effective, more competent, less narcissistic, and more determined to control, try to control, more clever at trying to control the instruments of state power, instead of turning it into a Marx Brothers movie, so often, and I don't want to trivialize the threat. I'm sitting here on Tuesday waiting to see what happens on Saturday on the 18th when the next iteration of this demonstration by a former Trump, Trump, current Trump acolyte gonna convene in the, near the Capitol to protest the patriots and the good citizens of the United States who, who are now the 500 of them, 50 plus have been charged, a few have been sentenced, who have are now unfairly treated. I mean, it's, well, it's beyond, it's beyond reality, but cruelly, it is reality. Well, we're a little over and I couldn't resist keep going. I'm gonna ask you one last question. Uh, so in our last question, I'd like uh, to, uh, to ask, you talk about the prominence of the domestic problems. No one's going to disagree with you uh, from the way we're hand handling uh, the COVID uh, to all of uh, to the problems of uh, January 6th that you just noted, et cetera. But you also talk, when you talked about our problems, you said you mentioned Iran and North Korea and China and Russia. Uh, and of course, now a lot of people are worried uh, that we also have to worry about, God forbid, another 9-11 or other countries do. Uh, where does that fit in your conception of the, uh, of the future? Well, I mean, look, the organizational premise of a foreign policy, what is the, what is the basic premise? goal, objective of any nation's foreign policy. It's to secure, it's to provide security. Security for yourself. <laughs> it's security to provide security and prosperity for the homeland. If, if you can, if, if that isn't the, the primary, I didn't say the only, if that isn't the primary objective of a nation's foreign policy, I don't know what is. And if you can't do that, you don't need a foreign policy. So I, I would argue to you that we do need a foreign policy 
and we're quite capable of finding a balance um, to become the indispensable power? No, that was a word one of my former bosses who, who I respect and admire greatly. And I'm gonna interview her on October 7th in the second of this new podcast we're launching. Uh, James Baker will be interviewed on September 29th. And I'll send you, you can distribute the invites to CMED. Great, um, thank you. Describe the United States as the indispensable power. Well, de Gaulle, you know, said the cemeteries of France are filled with indispensable people. We can't, what does indispensability mean? We have to be there for everybody at all times, no matter what the cost or the consequence? No. My dear friend, Bill Burns, who's now director of the Central Intelligence Agency, refers to America as a pivotal power. I like that much better. Pivotal suggests a degree of flexibility and discretion. We can actually pivot to places where, in fact, we stand a chance of, of actually being useful, if not instrumental, in helping others. And I don't want to deny the importance of values and ethics in foreign policy, even though I will say without any reservation or hesitation, I've rarely observed values, morality, and ethics to be at the top of America's priority <laughs> list during my time in government. Um, so I think we can do, we can, we can still be a leader. Uh, others are rising and we have to understand that they have legitimate interests. Um, but the battle, Steve, for American credibility abroad, I would argue, has to be won at home. Maybe not sequentially. And let me just, I know you're out of time, but let me just close with a quote from Lincoln. Lincoln addressed the Young Men's Lyceum in 1838. He was worried about mob violence. So the speech was tailored to something else, but he said this, and I think it applies. Lincoln said, at what point should we expect the approach of danger? By what means shall we fortify against it? Shall we expect some transatlantic military giant to step the ocean and crush us at a blow? Never. All the armies of Europe, Asia, and Africa combined with all the treasure of the earth, our own accepted in their military chest with a Bonaparte for a commander could not by force take a drink from the Ohio or make a track on the Blue Ridge in a trial of a thousand years. At what point then is the approach of danger to be expected? I answer, if it ever reach us, it must spring up amongst us. It cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. As a nation of free men writing in the 19th century, we must live through all time or die by suicide. Wow. Uh... A, 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 such an important end to such an important session. We went way over, and I take uh, full responsibility uh, for that because this was so important. And thank you, thank you, thank you, Aaron. We have several programs coming up, uh, and we'll be contacting you in a few days. We'll be announcing our uh, session for three webinars that are uh, coming up on uh, the implications uh, and importance of uh, the change in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, uh, I want to uh, not only thank uh, our brilliant speaker, but to thank all of you, and we look forward to seeing you again very, very soon. And so well, let me say bye-bye. <laughs>